folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another, no, an awesome Watchman video broadcast. Because this, not because of me, this Bible is awesome. And the numbers are going to show that to you today. All right, show it forth. Here we go. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. The number two is the number for what happened on the first day of creation. God divided the light from darkness. And so we have light, we have darkness, we have opposites, and he divides them from each other. Okay, and God saw the light that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the first day. God called the day, or the, the light, day, and the darkness he called night. Then on day two of creation... We have God uh, creating the firmament of the heaven, the expanse, that's what it means, and um, dividing the waters above that. I believe that there is some form of river, ocean, sea, something that separates the edge of this universe from God's eternal heaven, all right? Uh, certainly, there is water that separates the atmosphere of Earth from space. There's water up in the upper atmosphere. And there's also water separates Earth from land. And God did all of that on day two of creation. Okay, so that's the general meaning of it. Here's another meaning of it that we're going to deal with today. It has to do with witness, testimony. And God made it a law in his word that out of the mouth of one person, you can't, you can't go against somebody like in court or something like that. You can't accuse somebody of murdering, you know, one of your servants or kill, stealing some of your, you know, your, well, they didn't have hogs, but stealing some of your cattle or whatever. One witness wasn't enough to convict somebody, but two witnesses were were required. In fact, we're using two witnesses to establish the doctrine and the idea that to gain wisdom and knowledge from the Word of God, there are things that you do. One of them is counting things one by one, and that's what we're doing. We're taking individual numbers and we're counting things. The first witness is Revelation 13, 18. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score in six. The second witness is Ecclesiastes 7. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And he says in verse 27, Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. See that word account? It has the word count in it. And you count one by one to gain wisdom. That's how Solomon wrote it down. That's how Solomon found wisdom. Found it in the 666th chapter of the Bible. That's Ecclesiastes 7. And that matches perfectly with Revelation 13, 18, which is not like the 666 verse of something, but it is the verse that has wisdom and understanding coming from counting this particular number, 603 score and six. Do I know what that means yet? Do I know how it's going to be revealed? No. But understand the number first. That's going to kindergarten or first grade. Okay. Uh, and then maybe after a while we can go to grade two or grade three or grade four or whatever. We can move up as far as our knowledge is concerned. But be careful now with knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. And what will happen is you'll, you'll be right about something. God will show you something incredible from the Word of God. And you'll be right about it. And then you'll want to go out and prove everybody wrong. And you're puffing up over your knowledge and something that God showed you that you didn't deserve to have anyway. And here you are blasting everybody on social media because they don't have a particular answer that you have from Scripture. It's not supposed to be done that way, okay? you got to love people. 
You got to have knowledge, yes, but you got to love people too. All right. Anyway, moving on. So witness. So we have Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is the law now. God laid this down and said, this is how it's going to be. At the mouth of two witnesses or three, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. Now, in typology, anytime you see a man who is righteous, he's going to be a picture of Christ. In typology, anytime you see a man who is evil, that man is going to be a sort of a type of antichrist. Okay? So, in this verse, we have someone who is worthy of death, and he needs to be put to death. But if you only have one witness against him, you can't put him to death. God And God says, I know he did it, but you've got to have two witnesses. And one of the things I like about this law is that when you look into it and study it out, you'll find out that, you know, you can get two people to lie in court. But God said, okay... The two witnesses that you have that swear that they saw this man kill your son, okay? And you pass the sentence of death upon this man for killing your son, and your two witnesses say, we saw him do it, I saw him do it, I saw him do it. Then those two witnesses have to be the first ones who pick up stones and start bashing that man's skull in. They must be the first two people to start throwing stones at someone and passing forth the sentence of death upon him. Now, your conscience may not bother you too bad when you lie, but now you're going to take somebody's life. I mean, I just like God's fairness in this thing. This kind of cuts out people being false witnesses. Just thought I'd throw that in there. I got to move on because we got a lot to talk about today. Cool stuff. I like the cool stuff from the Bible, all right? And I know you do too. So at the mouth of two witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death? Think Antichrist here, okay? And out of one witness's mouth, you can't, you can't kill him. We need another witness, okay? So. We have Revelation chapter 11. In the days of the Antichrist, the Antichrist is going to reign 42 months. These two witnesses, let's read the verse first. Revelation 11, 3 and 4, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's 42 months. That's three and a half years. Um, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And so uh, think of these two witnesses as men representing uh, the law that we just read. The law of you can't sentence anybody to death unless you have two witnesses. And guess who their mortal enemy is if you read Revelation 11? It's the Antichrist. He's going to come up out of the pit. And he's going to kill these two men. Why? Because they can sentence him to death. Or something like that. Okay? But lo and behold, after, what is it, three and a half days? The men get back up. They're not dead anymore. Uh-oh. The two witnesses that were dead, now they're alive again. And now the sentence of death can be passed upon the Antichrist. I would just, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. You just kind of take that and ponder that for a while. Anyway, in Revelation 11, it mentions that these two witnesses have already been seen in symbolic form in the Old Testament. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, what are, what is he talk, what is John talking about anyway? Okay, what are these two olive trees and two candlesticks. Well, these go back to the prophet Zechariah. 
And Zechariah was shown this exact thing in Zechariah chapter 4. Um, in Zechariah chapter 6, I think, is where Zechariah gets to see the four horses that we see in Revelation chapter 6, the four horses and their horsemen and their chariots, okay? You know, chariots. Spirit. Anyway, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2, And said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and the two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. And then in verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I love this passage, okay? It took me a, a while, years, to really understand what I've gotten so far, and I don't think I even know a third or even a fourth or a twentieth of what this really is. But what I do understand about it, I like it. Because it says that these uh, two olive trees, they are the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Okay? Not by, and, it, and the word of the Lord is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, my breath. And what is God's breath? It's the word of God. Okay? What comes out of Jesus' mouth in Revelation 19? A Bible. Okay? A sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. All right? So anyway, it, they represent the word of the Lord. Now, you just hang on to that. I want you to follow me on this. Take a look at this. This is a representation of the candlestick that we know was in the tabernacle of Moses. It was in Solomon's temple, for sure. And we know that it's in heaven, the temple in heaven, by way of Revelation chapter 4. Because in Revelation 4, John gets to see the temple in heaven. And he sees that there's a seven golden candlesticks. And in those seven candlesticks, they represent and are the seven spirits of God. So back in Zechariah, that's exactly what Zechariah was told by the angel. We have the seven lamps. We have the uh, seven pipes, the seven lamps. We have the two olive trees by it, one on the right side, the other on the left. And he said, these are, or this is, the word of the Lord. And so in Revelation chapter 4, we see that the seven candlesticks are the seven spirits of God. And, lo and behold, I'm in Isaiah, so I look in Isaiah 11. And here we have the seven spirits of God. All mentioned in verse 2 of chapter 11, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, that's five, the spirit of knowledge, that's six, and fear of the Lord, that's seven. 33 words, we've talked about this before, but verse 2 has 33, wor 33 words in it, exactly. I love this, okay? Because we're going to go back to this candlestick. Those candlesticks represent the Holy Spirit of God, and they represent what the Holy Spirit really is. The Holy Spirit is the Word of the Lord, and the Word of the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And just like with Jesus, you can't separate the two. If one is, the other is. And if God is, God is and God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they all are the representation of the written word of God that you and I hold in our hands, the word of life. That's John chapter 1, okay? Now, take a look at this, this representation here. You see it's got decorations on it. This was given exactly to the letter uh, by God to Moses. Moses got to see the one in heaven. We know that from the scriptures. And 
Moses then is told exactly how to build this candlestick. He says, I want these seven pipes, and on these uh, outer pipes, I want, uh, I want uh, the decorations there, like from an almond tree, a knob or a knob, a, f a flower and a bud. So you have three sets of little tiny decorations, and you have three of them. Let me show you this. You have three sets of three decorations on each one of those pipes, except the middle one. So on the right hand, you have three pipes with three sets of decorations. And on the left hand, you have three pipes with three sets of decorations. And in the middle, it's different. The middle one has four sets of decorations, each of them having three separate parts, a, a knob, a flower, and a bud. Okay. So when you count all of these together, you have 39 as far as the left side goes and the middle pipe, there's 39 individual decorations and 27 on the right hand pipes exactly. And 39 plus 27 is precisely how the Bible, the Word of God, was separated. Remember, we go back to the meeting of the number two, and it was like separated, but it's also unified, okay? Because we talked about this last time, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, and you're basically repeating this pattern of two, that doctrine comes from reading over here, and then reading over here. And the very candlestick that God designed and told Moses, put it exactly the way you saw it up in heaven, build it exactly this way, 39 decorations on the left side, 27 decorations on the right side. That totals up to 66 decorations. Hooray! That's the number of books in the Bible. This is how we know we're right about what that candlestick represented. First of all, it is the seven spirits of God that we read in Isaiah chapter 11 with those 33 words. And then we, we see that um, those seven spirits, you can find all of that, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit, the fear of the Lord, all of those are inside the Bible, the word of God. And the word of God is two witnesses. Old Testament, New Testament, and their witnesses agree with each other. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We learned that the last time, okay? You see how all this, it, it like comes back on itself. And what we learned last time, we're relearning it, only now we're adding some things to it. It's just like, okay, we, we got out of kindergarten last time. Now we are moving into first grade. Hopefully by the time we're done, we'll be maybe ready for second grade, okay? But we got to keep moving along. So that candlestick, I mean, think about it. Moses builds a candlestick with exactly 66 decorations in it, foretelling us who believe the exact number of books that was going to be in the two witnesses of the mouth of God the Holy Bible, okay? I mean, again, what I just showed you is a fact. There are 39 decorations on the left side and the middle pipe. There are 27 decorations on the right three pipes. There is no argument there. God even divided them up in the, in the scripture. I just don't have time to get into the scriptures where he told about exactly how he wants it, but God is the one who divided all that up. And no matter how you count it, there's going to be 66 decorations at the end of the day on this candlestick, which basically makes up seven candlesticks, which are the seven spirits of God. And according to Zechariah, they are the two olive trees, which are the word of the Lord, not by might, not, not by power, but by my spirit, by my candlesticks, saith the Lord. I'm not done. Watch this now. 
in Revelation chapter 4, remember, John sees the seven candlesticks, which are the seven spirits of God. Spirit, the word spirit, uh, comes from Latin to us, and it's a, it means breath. Okay, it's all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that Greek word is theop neustos. Theos is God. Neusta means breath, like pneuma. Theop neustos. All scripture is God breathed, inspiration of God. So when God breathes, what did Jesus do with his uh, 11 remaining apostles? He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. So the breath of Jesus Christ. What comes out of his mouth, we know, is a double-edged sword, which is the Word of God. All goes back to it, okay? Some people can't handle that. Can't help you. I'm trying to help you. But anyway, now, look at this graphic again. I've done this before. Some of you have not seen this. <laughs> this is so cool. So there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That's from Revelation 4. So we see that that represents the Old Testament and New Testament, the air or spirit. I like this. I like this because in the, in the typology of the body, the head is God and the head is in heaven. So where does all of our nutrition come from in the body? It comes from the head. The head sends it down there. Where does all the oxygen for our blood and for our muscles and veins and nerves and everything, all of our organs need, need oxygen. Where does that come from? Comes from one, two, three holes in our head. Okay. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit comes from the head. Where is it that the body hears things from the head? Where is it that the body smells things? The head. What does the body taste things? The head. It's all done in the head. Okay? All the senses right here in the head. And yet, he put two lungs, not up here on the head like fish have, gills. They're down here where the body is. Right? On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came down from heaven and fell upon them. And now the Holy Spirit dwells with the body of Christ. That's why our two lungs are not up here in our head. They're down here in our body. Giving oxygen and nutrition and all the things that everything part of our body needs from these two lungs. Now, follow me on this. Take a look at these lungs here. That trachea. In fact, let me, let me give you a better picture of it. Notice the trachea. Okay. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this picture of our lungs and, um, the, the, I got to get this right. The bronchial tubes. I'm going to turn it upside down so you'll recognize it better. Ah, now it looks like a tree, doesn't it? You have the trunk of the tree, which is that middle pipe from the almond tree that was the candlestick with the 66 decorations, which were the seven spirits of God. And then, not done, notice that the bronchial trunk separates off one to the right side, one to the left side. Let me put it up next to the candlestick. And you will notice that we'll count one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven. The seven spirits of God are in our lungs. There's seven branches, the middle branch and three branches to each lung. Are you, are you kidding me? It's our lungs are designed exactly the way the Holy Spirit works and is represented by the seven golden candlesticks, which are the Old and the New Testament 
and the 39 books on one side and the 27 books on the other. People, you just can't, you can't make this stuff up. Man didn't, some man did not invent this and jam it into the Bible somewhere. There's no way. Because we know that different parts of the Bible came to us at different times in earth's history. We know that Job was probably the first one to write from the Bible. Because he lived about the time Abraham did. We know that Moses wrote the, the history all the way up until his own funeral, Genesis through Deuteronomy. We know that he wrote all of that in his day. We know that David wrote large portion of the Psalms. We know that Solomon wrote good portion of the Proverbs. We know he wrote Ecclesiastes, so we know his time. We also know that after the last prophet in the Bible, uh, Malachi, there was 400 years where God didn't speak a word to anybody. And then we have the word of God coming down from heaven, Jesus Christ. We have the four gospel writers who lived at his time, who were writing about his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Then we have the doings of the, or the acts of the early church and the apostles in the book of Acts. That was written uh, somewhere around the time that maybe the gospels were being written. Luke wrote, Acts, we know that, we know he wrote the Gospel of Luke. And then we have the books coming after it that Paul wrote, that Peter wrote, James, John. And then John finally finishing everything off with the book of Revelation somewhere in the, in the A.D. 90s, somewhere in that area. I don't remember exactly what year they think he wrote it in. But what I'm getting at is there's no way that these 40 men could have somehow worked out some sort of secret plan to make it look like that our lungs represent the seven spirits of God because of the bronchioles and the, all of that stuff that I just showed you. In other words, man cannot manipulate that. God is the one who designed it. He's the one who put it. In fact, you know what? I'm going to give you another illustration. I showed you, uh, what was it, Deuteronomy, about the, the witness, let's see here. Yeah, Deuteronomy 17, 6, and at the mouth of two witnesses or three, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. There's a second witness to that verse, okay? <laughs> there has to be, right? 2 Corinthians 13, this is the third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So now I, I think this talks of doctrine, but it, it could speak of almost anything. But certainly, if someone tried to convince me of something, and I've had people do this, if you try to convince me of something, you, you think you see something in the Bible that no one's heard of, no one's known anything about it, no one's ever seen it ever. And number one, you can't show me a verse, one verse in the Bible that says what you say. I'm not going to, probably not going to listen to it. If you show me one verse that says what you say, I will say, okay, that's one verse. Is there a second verse? Not somebody you know named Jimbo that agrees with you on it. He's your second witness. That doesn't count. Every man's a liar. I need two Bible. Where I need two Bible verses is what I need to in order to establish a principle, a doctrine. Okay, that's what I try to do when I teach on numbers. I try to show you the two witnesses that I follow. That's where I'm getting my idea from is to count things in the Bible. All right. Notice, notice th that he says something peculiar. He doesn't just say, at, at two witnesses shall everything be established. If there are two witnesses, he uses the phrase, in the mouth of two witnesses. Did you ever notice that? In, the, in fact, I just noticed it just now. 
I thought it said at the mouth. It says in the mouth, which only, thank you, God, it, it only solidifies what I'm about to show you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. What, what's in our mouth? Teeth and, and thang. And I'm going to get a little bit more dignified here. Teeth and a tongue. And the male mouth, this male mouth, the human mouth. Maybe it is just the male mouth. I don't know. Anyway, just in the human mouth, 32 teeth. But what else is in the mouth? The tongue. 33. The mouth. In the mouth. But that's only one witness. By the way, I mean, that 33, who is that number? It's Christ. Who came to this earth, lived 33 years, and died. Meaning, the age you die at, you're always that age. He's 33. So he came the first time. That was the first witness. When he comes the second time, that's a second witness. God speaketh once, yea, twice. Okay? So one mouth, in one mouth is 33. In two mouths, you guessed it, is 66. In the mouth of two witnesses, 66. Let every word be established. Simply put, I won't believe it if I can't prove it from the scriptures. I know I teach on some things that are kind of out there. And maybe that's not for everybody. I understand that. But it, a lot of people like what's out there. They want to know. They're like me. I want to know. I want to know what these things flying around are. I want to know what these things that are scaring the doo-doo out of people all over the country, all over the world. I want to know. And I want to know it from the only source that I trust. And that's this book. So according to the very words that God said in the mouth of two witnesses, I can believe every word in these 66 books of my Bible. Mm -mm -mm. Revelation 1.5 from Jesus Christ, who is what? The faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. He's the faithful witness. And remember what I said, he came the first time, that's, the mouth, that's in the mouth, one mouth. When he comes again, notice that the sharp sword is coming out of his mouth. That's because it's a two-edged sword, not just a one-edged sword. One-edged sword is only one testament. A two-edged sword is the Old and New Testament together. Exodus, we have, a, we have a picture of this in the Bible. And it's in Exodus. And it has to do with Moses, who is acting out the typology of Christ. In Exodus 32, 15, Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written, look at this, on both their sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written. How many tables did Moses have? Two. And they were written just, just like my Bible is. On this side of the page and on this side of the page. They were written in stone. Why do you think? Number one, they're written in stone, which means you can't take the words off of the stone. You can't erase what's been chiseled and etched in the stone. You can't erase that. Number two, they're written on both sides. Why? 
you fill up this side and this side and the this side, this side here, and there's no more room to add anything else. God's smarter than we are, people. He figured, he figured stuff out way before we thought it up. And so you've got people all over, you've got religions all over the world claiming Christianity in some form or another, and what do they do? They either add to the Word of God or they take away from the Word of God. But Moses is telling us, uh, sorry guys, you can't do that. They were written by the hand of God on both sides. They're double witness, okay? Revelation 5, 1, that, that matches the book that God had in his hand. I saw in the right hand of him within, that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. The same book that God the Father gives God the Son in Revelation 5, and he opens up in Revelation 6, is a book that is written on both sides so that you cannot add words to it and you cannot take words away from it. Can't do it. Okay? And then, when Moses came down the first time with the two tables, what happened? Well, they just happened to be breaking everything God told them not to do up there. They were doing it. And they were doing it naked. And so Moses, in his anger, throws the tablets down, breaking the tablets, thus breaching the contract, the covenant, that God would have made with Israel. But they were down there breaking everything that God had written on those tablets. And so the covenant was breached. It was broken. But... God's a merciful God, isn't he? He's the God of second chances. He's a God of a thousand second chances. So Moses goes back up. The Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And so in verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He's acting out like Christ did. And by the way, I mentioned the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. What about in Matthew 17, when Jesus' face is transfigured and his face shines like the sun? Who's there to see it as far as heaven is concerned? Two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, because God says it's got to be two witnesses, okay? It doesn't matter how big or how small. What I do is there's got to be two witnesses. So here comes Moses the first time, breaks the commandments. Here comes Moses the second time. Now Israel says, all that thou hast said we will do. So now Israel agrees, yes, we'll follow that covenant. We'll do what God said. Now, we know that the Jews didn't keep the Ten Commandments. We certainly haven't kept the Ten Commandments. So God had one covenant with Israel that was at Mount Sinai, and that covenant was broken a, hundred, a thousand times by the Jews. So then, Jeremiah 31, 31, God promises another covenant. Only this one's not going to be like the one at Mount Sinai, where it said, if you do all these things, you shall live. God says, I'm just going to forgive all your sins. How's that? I'm just going to wipe the slate clean. I'm going to forgive every one of your sins. I'm not going to hold anything that you or your forefathers have ever done, are doing now, or will do in the future. I am wiping them all clean. And I'm going to take my law and I'm going to put it in your heart. And you'll just be doing the things that I have written in there just by your nature now because you have a new nature because I put my law in your inward parts. That's God's second covenant. That's a better one than the first one, isn't it? Okay? And it sets a, a, a theme in the Bible that when God does something once, boy, it's good. 
But when he does it the second time, whoa, it is phenomenal. That's not even a word that describes the majesty of God doing something twice, including speaking. Job 33, 14, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. I just came from preaching a funeral and I had three pages full of scripture verses that I gave to those people. I just went boom, 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 boom. I had some people saying, amen, amen, amen. And I thanked them for that. But I started talking about sin and how people are sinners and people do wrong things. And I was reading the verses and one person shouted, okay. Now I may have misread or misjudged what that young lady was getting at. But it sounded like to me, she didn't want to hear any more about sin, doing wrong, having to, having to repent. So I just, I prayed for her. You, you pray for her. You don't know her. You don't know who I'm talking about. But what I'm getting at is, I gave Verse after verse after verse after verse of scripture, 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 easy to understand stuff. John 3.16, okay? Um, Romans 3.23, things like that. And there's always people in every funeral service I ever preach that it goes right over their head. In fact, it annoys them that I'm like preaching from the Bible I'm, okay, what am I? A preacher? A word, a word of God preacher? That's what I am? What do you think I'm supposed to do? A cooking presentation to show you how to cook roast duck? No, I'm supposed to show you the word of God. But God speaketh once, yea, twice. Man perceiveth it not. You can give people Bible verses from Old and New Testament, and people still won't get it. Psalm 62, 11. Here's the second witness. God has spoken once, twice. <laughs> I can stop right there. God has spoken once, twice. <laughs> I'll finish reading. Twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. There again, it says God speaks once. He says twice, I've heard this. Who do you hear it from? He heard it from God. So here we have, the principle of God speaketh once, yea, twice. We have that principle given to us twice in the Bible. It's a double witness of itself, okay? And I, I just love this because remember what we said a while ago, what God does the first time is like, oh, that is amazing. What God does the second time. Paul said it like this. He said, he was talking about Moses coming down from Mount Sinai and the whole veil thing, and he said, if he said, if Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the first covenant and that covenant, basically all it did was say, you're going to die in your sins and you're, I, I want you to live by these, but I know you're not, you're going to die in your sins. And, and Paul's saying, if Moses coming down with that covenant was so glorious that Moses face had to be covered with a veil, how much more glorious is a new covenant being brought down by Jesus himself going to be that much more glorious. In other words, if you think Moses' face was shining bright, wait until you see Jesus' face. It's going to be billions of times brighter than even the sun. Oh, I can't wait for that day. And so that's, that's what he's saying here. What God does the first time is glorious. What God does the second time 
way more glorious. And it's that way with the two covenants. And I reject all of the Hebrew roots people, Seventh-day Adventists, people who say, well, I keep the law. We keep the law. We don't, we don't do pagan holidays in our house. We keep the law. Yeah, you're bragging about it. That's exact. You're the exact person Paul was talking about when he said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because everybody I've ever met who believes that they're going to be saved by law keeping boasts about it. Anyway, got to move on. So, we have the first coming of Christ, and it ended in his death. It ended in him being cursed because cursed is him who hangeth from a tree. Ended up Christ's blood being shed. What a, what a day that was. But then he rose from the dead. Is he coming back? Acts chapter one. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, how many men? Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The same Jesus, same Jesus, he's coming back. Okay? Don't worry. Don't worry. He's coming back. Uh, again, only this time he's not going to have to die. This time he's not shedding his blood. This time he doesn't have to carry everybody's sins on his, on his head or he doesn't have to do that. This time he's coming to set the whole world right. Oh, can't wait to live in that world. Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear when? The second time without sin unto salvation. I just said that. Hebrews 10, 9, then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Oh, I love this. Hebrews 10. Let's go back to that because we have recorded for us in Hebrews the exact words that Jesus said before he comes down to the earth the first time to be baby Jesus, okay? And those words were, verse 7 of Hebrews 10, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Jesus is going to do it by the book. Well, Mike, uh, not everything that God does is by the Bible. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, it is. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So, that's, that's uh, verse 7. Verse 8 says, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. And just follow, just follow me on this. Okay? Christ nullified and made void this covenant, do and live. Christ nullified that, made it void. He fulfilled every term in the law of God. He did, we weren't righteous, we didn't keep the law, Jesus did, every one of them. So, 
guess what? Jesus gets then to receive all the things that God promised that he would give to whoever kept his law. Jesus is going to get every bit of that. But Jesus is not greedy. He's going to share it. We're joint heirs with Christ, aren't we? By belief. So when he comes again, he says it again. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now I'm going to take away the first that I may establish the second. The new covenant. Isn't that glorious? So he does away with the first covenant. He establishes the second covenant, the new covenant, the New Testament, as the one that we are under. And let me say something about Bible translations. Okay? I was saved by the words of this contract. King James Version Bible. Don't try to get me to accept a different contract worded differently. Because I won't do it. This contract and the words that are in this contract are the words that I was saved under and I will accept no other ever. And you shouldn't either. Not, not if you were, okay? Uh, but anyway, when he says he takes, when he takes away the first, he may establish the second. I got two bodies. The one I'm living in now. But he has to take this one away so that I can live in the new body. You see how that works now? L let me show you some verses. Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I am this and I am this. Okay? I'm the last. I'm the last. I'm the last. I am Omega. I am the end. I am the last. Job 8. Notice this now. This is how God works. In Job, though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. This was spoken of Job. And what happened? Job had lost everything at the beginning of the book of Job. And yet, notice what, ha notice what it says in Job 42, 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. He even gave him three daughters that were the most beautiful women in the entire world. Okay? That's a proud daddy right there. But notice that the latter end of Job was better than the first. It's like yeah, Job mourned the loss of his daughters and sons. He mourned the loss of all of his wealth. He mourned the loss of his own health. He wanted to die. But God took away all of the pain and the misery from that. And he restored him double than what he had the first time. Look at John chapter 2. This is the first Miracle that Jesus performed, right? Making water into wine. And which version of the wine did the governor of the feast like? The first wine that they drank up or the second wine that Jesus made? When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And I guarantee you, this good wine didn't make them busted up drunk. I guarantee you that. You'll never convince me that my Lord, a teetotaler, would intoxicate people 
when everything in this Bible dealing with wine and strong drink indicates to us that it's the most foolish, stupid thing that you can do is to make yourself drunk and that as a form of judgment, God gives people drunkenness, but not by wine. It's drunkenness by a spirit. Never convince me otherwise. Hmm. Oh, look at this. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, which is better, your first birth or your second birth? Your second birth is. Because your second birth, your first birth gives you life in this world. The second birth gives you life in heaven eternally. Okay? Ephesians 4.22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Colossians 3 is a second witness. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So which, which would you rather have? The old man that's corrupt and it's full of sin and regret and guilt and going to hell or the new man? Remember how God works. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. The truth of it is, before I can go to heaven, I got to die. As coming from someone who has been on the verge of death before, I'm not looking forward to have that happen again. There's a, a fear and a terror that comes with dealing with your own mortality. I try to convey that today at the funeral. Um, people are afraid to die. It's in our nature. The sorrows of death compass me, is what David said in the Psalms. So, I understand that I have a new man and a new body that I'm going to get, but he has, God has to take away the first so that he can establish the second. Now, I mean, if I'm alive at Christ appearing in the air, then I'll be in good shape, okay? But I may have to die first. One, one way or the other. I would rather have the new man than the old man. You, you, you want a picture of what that's like? Sarah. Sarah's the old man. How old is she? She's 90 years old. But inside of her is the new man. A man of, that's why God waited till she was 90 years old. Number one, to show forth his power. God can make a 90 year old woman give birth to a baby and like it. Okay? But then it shows the idea that, yes, there is the old man, it's an old body. Everybody's like, how in the world did Sarah get pregnant? Oh, my goodness. You know, you can imagine what the neighbors think. But then she has this new man, and he's a child of God's promise. He's the new man inside the old man. Mm, 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 mm. And God actually mentions Sarah and Isaac, Hagar and Ishmael to give us this illustration. He said in Galatians 4, For it is written that Abraham had two sons. One, two. 
One was not so good. The other one was a child of promise. The one by a bond maid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. That's the old man with its deeds. It's corrupt. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory, which is like a typology. In fact, the, I think the Greek word here is tupos, typology. Okay, For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar or Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So you can either keep trying to keep the law, which is the covenant of Sinai, which is Hagar and Ishmael, and they're both in bondage because Hagar was a slave woman. And Sarah said, well, maybe that's God's plan. I don't know. And, and boy, it caused trouble, didn't it? Okay. But then Sarah gives birth to Isaac and God says, that's the one. That's the son that you, that is going to carry on and be my child of promise. And, and just like in that day when Hagar and Ishmael, they mocked Sarah and Isaac and like was mean to him. And Sarah went crying to Abraham and said, Abraham, my own servant, Hagar and her son, they hate us. They hate your son, Isaac. They hate me. They're all the time bashing us and persecuting us. And finally, Abraham has to put them out. And you know what God said? It's the same now. And, and I'll tell you this, it is true that every religion that is based on works for salvation always tries to destroy those who believe in free grace by belief alone. Persecution, um, you name it, coming from Every cult, every false religion that has a work-based salvation. They, just like Hagar and Ishmael hated them then, they hate us now. Boy, I know that's true. Oh, but God's got something better for us. Notice Haggai 2, there's a, there's a prophecy. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, he's talking about Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was destroyed. So God says to Haggai, Haggai, I want you to write this down, that the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former house, like Solomon's house. Solomon's house is like amazing, all right? Now, so they rebuild the temple, but where's it at? It got destroyed again. Herod like revamped it, and so it was called Herod's temple. And in AD 70, here come the Roman legions, and they destroy the whole thing, tear down all the stones and the bricks and steal everything out of there and burnt the whole city with fire. So where is that ladder house? It hadn't come yet. Where is it? You're looking at it. It's here. Okay. My new body is the glory of the ladder house. Okay, because Christ will dwell in this temple, not made with hands. Isaiah 65, 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Think about that. And that's what he says in Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death 
neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I look forward, not backward. Whenever I look backward, I don't like some things I see. So I'd rather look forward to the day when Christ shall appear, we shall be caught up, or our graves be opened. Either way, I look forward to that day. That's, that's pro about the most amazing thing that I can say about the number two is that it represents what's going to happen to me and you eventually. We're going to get rid of the first. God's going to establish the second. And that's what I'm looking forward to. That's the hope that I stand upon today. I hope you have that same hope. And if not, get the Word of God out and read it. God will lead you to righteousness. Okay? God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.